It is my great pleasure to introduce Assemblymember Buffy Wicks. Jake Brimner um, of my team had been telling me about this, you know, rock star who was going to be running for the legislature, a young mother who had um, an incredibly, uh, you know, prestigious track record of fighting against inequity. Um, we know Buffy has been a champion for innovative strategies for representation of voices that quite often are not at the table, first through the work that she did for Howard Dean's presidential campaign, and then in reimagining the way Obama ran his campaign through some of her grassroots organizing tactics. We have been so thrilled to have her on uh, in the state legislature as a voice that is so connected to the issues that we see that gra students are grappling with day in, day out. One thing I will tell you, when I first met Buffy, she shared when we were talking about college affordability that free community college was not enough, that we actually had to address the real challenges related to affordability, total cost of attendance, mm -hmm. the ability to actually meet the needs of students who were trying to pay for transportation, books, housing, all of the critical components of actually being able to move through and complete a degree. And when I heard that, I knew that she was going to be courageous and willing to tackle difficult issues and to look at the nuances of policy when it came to higher ed. So without further ado, we are so proud to have this event with Assemblymember Buffy Wicks and to thank her for being a champion right out of the gate in co-authoring AB 290, or Senate, Senate uh, SB 291 with Senator Leva to address college affordability for vulnerable students at community colleges. Yeah, Thank you. Voice. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm a couple minutes late. Um, well, first off, I want to thank you all for being here and thank you for putting on this event. Um, we need to have this conversation every day, in every forum, in every opportunity that we can. Um, you know, I kind of come to this issue just from my own personal story. You know, I'm, I don't come from wealth. I grew up in a trailer. My parents didn't, I'm not, come, I don't come from like a politically connected family or any of those things. And, um, you know, my mom was, was 35 when she decided to go to college for the first time when I was a little kid. And she went to community college. And then she did that for a couple of years. Then she transferred to Sac State and took her, I think, six, six, seven years to get her degree, but she finally did. Um, and she was the first time, first person in her family to ever get her degree. And my brother and I, our only pathway to get a college degree was through the community college system. And um, you know, I believe it's one of the last institutions in our society that allow poor and working class people to become middle class people. We don't have enough of those ladders of opportunity for folks. Um, and then when you get to the UC or the CSU, right, there's still a lot of challenges in terms of completing that work that we see. Um, and a lot of that is, as you mentioned, is um, the cost of, of housing in this area. It's insanely expensive. We have homeless students at UC Berkeley right now. I mean, this is one of the premier institutions in the world, and we have homeless students at UC Berkeley right now who can't afford to live here in this community. And so it isn't just about the tuition. Um, it's about the other things that are with that. Um, and so I'm, I'm a big believer, you know, I'm still, I was just telling Dean when we were driving over, I'm still paying off my student loans. Uh, I'm 42 years old and I'm paying off my student loans. Uh, I still have a couple more years on them. Um, and you know, when I think about how we value education in our society, across the board, by the way, early childhood, K through 12, higher ed, across the board, we're not valuing it enough. And when you look at what happens to young people who are graduating with their degrees now with $100,000 in debt, with a cost of living of what it is, we are robbing our young people of the American dream. At least the way that we think of traditionally, historically, the American dream, right? We're robbing young people of that opportunity. And I should also say, there are older folks like my mom, right, who go to school at, a, at an older age. And we need to do everything we can to create those on-ramps. Learning should be a lifelong continuum. Um, and so we need to create uh, better um, financial mechanisms for people of all ages to continue to get education. Not, not all of us are on the four-track school, my mom and dad pay for it track, right? And for those that are great, like more power to you, but it, that's, that's rare and it's increasingly rare. And there's also a real major equity lens that we have to look at this issue. Right, we have to look at how the cost of education disproportionately impacts people of color. 
and access to education disproportionately impacts people of color. Because uh, that, that impacts their ability then to uh, earn higher wages. You know, and you look at this kind of constant um, ongoing income inequality and the racial lens around that, and we can't address that unless we create this access for opportunity. And we look at everything through an equity lens. And you see Berkeley, that I, the institution that I represent and love and think is great, 2% African American. That's uncomfortable, right? But we have to talk about those uncomfortable facts and why that is and what's leading to that to really be able to address it. Um, so those are some of the things in terms of what I think about when I think about higher ed in our society. And, and, and so then the question is, what are we gonna do about it, right? How do we then um, kind of put our money where our mouth is? And that's why um, you know, Connie Leva's bill that I'm a co-author of, um, SB 291, is critical because it basically creates um, a financial mechanism for community college students to be able to receive grants uh, and other financial aid um, at the community college level. And yes, the free community college now we're up to two years free is great, but for me that, that wasn't my main cost, right? And for a lot of us it's not the main cost of tuition. It's a piece of it, for sure, and yes, we should take that, but how are, how are um, students affording um, the cost of living? You know, the average cost for a student in, in what was it, in, in the Central Valley is like $700 a month, in San Francisco it's $1,700 a month. You know, and I'm sure many of the students here are paying those types of rates for, for, for living here. So how do we really address that? And I think that's a piece of it. There's also a bill Mark Stone um, uh, is doing, which I'm a big supporter of, and he's been a real champion, at the Student uh, uh, Borrow bill, bill of Rights, and more understanding around the student loan industry and how we're you know, having transparency and understanding for folks who are taking loans out. Um, in, in that regard, which I think is also important. So we have to continue to do these things. We have to continue to invest in our higher ed, invest through an equity lens, understanding um, that those, those equity issues are real, um, and, and create public policy that, that really fundamentally drives that. Because I don't want folks to be 42 years old and still paying off their student loans. You know, I mean, I'm glad that I have the opportunity to take out loans and to, you know, get the education that, you know, as someone who grew up in a trailer and then like went to college and then worked at the White House, like it was, it's worth every penny for me. Uh, and I look at my own like sort of life experience, um, but, but we need to value it more. And frankly, we need to go back to the original vision of the master plan that created our community college UC and CSU system that said everyone should be able to go to college for free. That was the original vision. And we've way walked that vision back now. You know, and you look at like UC Berkeley, it guess how much it gets from the state for its entire budget. It's like 10%, right? And so a lot of, they have to find resources elsewhere. So um, those are some of the things that we're working on in Sacramento. Um, I would love to hear from you all on the things that you view as important and critical. Um, and thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Assembly Member. I think that you all can probably see why I was so excited that <laughs> She, when she was a candidate and running for the assembly that I, I shared with Jesse, and I'm gonna just very quickly go over um, a few of the issues that the assembly members already called out. Um, if I can get the slides to uh, cooperate with me. Um, so I'm gonna just very briefly go over this so that the assembly member can hear from all of you around what these issues actually feel like in the affordability landscape. We have not only end users of financial aid or those who are going to class with their peers who are uh, tapping into financial aid, we have experts in the room and practitioners. So really want to um, create time for you all to share um, with Assembly Member Wicks and her team. So uh, this was touched on already. For the past 15 years, um, we have really seen a um, major increase in the total cost of attendance, not only tuition, but all of these other expenses that students need to incur in order to attend and be successful in higher education. In the past 15 years, a 200% increase. And despite spending four times the amount on Cal Grant programs than we did back in 2001, hundreds of thousands of our low-income students who our programs deemed eligible for aid are still receiving exactly zero dollars in financial aid. Um, at the same time, 40 to 50 percent of students, depending on the segment, whether they're at the colleges, the CSU, or the UC, are not paying tuition or fees and are still food or housing insecure. So how have we gotten to this point where we have such a muddled, um, disjointed financial aid and affordability system here in California? Um, and you will find in, uh, in front of you, uh, both an agenda for today and behind that, um, a student success profile for Assembly District 15. 
And one of the metrics that we've uh, provided for you there is what the net price looks like for low-income students at each of the institutions here in the 15th Assembly District. And this is for a low-income student who would be eligible for federal and state financial aid. Um, and as our partners at TICAS have been able to, to call out in their research, comparing net price for colleges and universities throughout the state, um, that in no area where you can make a comparison across the public segments is the community college option going to be the most affordable. And that is also true here uh, in the East Bay, where students at UC Berkeley, if you're low income, still face a steep gap in unmet need, um, just a little bit shy of $10,000. And this is coming from the net price calculator that's listed on each of the institution's websites. Mm -hmm. However, we can see that at Berkeley City College, at Contra Costa College, um, students are facing a considerably higher gap, uh, closer to $15,000 for the institutions that we're marketing as the affordable pathway to opportunity and to a credential or a degree or a transfer. So what does this tell us um, about students and their affordability challenges in the 15th district and throughout the state? Um, it's clear that regardless of segment, students are facing a steep net price and have significant unmet need, that there's a lack of sufficient state aid for those non-tuition expenses, and that there's less state aid available for community college students. And this is due in no small part really to the structural design of our financial aid program. We have what's called the Entitlement Cal Grant and what's called the Competitive Cal Grant. And as I, I believe many of you know, um, this was, was borne out through how um, Cal Grant was overhauled in 2001. When we created an entitlement program that was meant to benefit students who had just recently graduated from high school. Um, if you are, uh, 364 days after your high school graduation, you are in the entitlement pool and guaranteed state financial aid. If you are applying 366 days after your high school graduation, you are going to find yourself in the competitive Cal Grant pool. And good luck, uh, because unfortunately, um, it is very difficult, um, regardless of your financial need or your academic merit, to actually access aid through the competitive pool. This past year, and we are very grateful for our partners in the legislature and Governor Newsom for approving the largest ever increase in the history of the competitive Cal Grant program. We will now be at 41,000 total competitive awards. And yet, still fewer than one of eight students who we say are financially needy and have the academic standing to benefit from financial aid, still fewer than one of eight of these students will receive a competitive award. And what I find really difficult, and I say this as a proud Golden Bear Cal alum who benefited from institutional and university and state aid when I attended Berkeley, um, there's a 12% rate now for when you look at the 300,000 plus students applying for a competitive Cal grant and you look at the 41,000 total awards, 12% of students are going to get that competitive award. The admission rate to UC Berkeley, when I checked, was 15% overall. It is harder to get into the Cal Grant program than to get into Cal. And I think that should really uh, call out to us as a, a problem here and that our affordability system is broken. So what if you do receive an award, though? Uh, it is not enough, and I'm sure that our students could attest to that. We've seen, and I think this is acutely felt here in the East Bay, I say this as a former Oaklander and a former resident of Berkeley. We know um, what housing has felt like here in the past few years. 44% increase in median rent costs across the state of California that the California Budget and Policy Centers reported. And in that same time, an 8% increase in the Cal Grant B Access Award that actually helps students offset these non-tuition expenses. So even just looking at housing, clear mismatch between what the increase in cost has looked like and what the increase in safe support looks like. Um, just this past week, the California Student Aid Commission hosted a conversation in Sacramento around early results that they could report out from the Student Expenses and Resources Survey, which had been um, discontinued or suspended really since 2006 and 2007. We were using inflation rates to just kind of guesstimate what affordability issues look like since then. This was the state's mean of trying to understand what costs students need to incur as they're moving through higher education and how they're able to overcome those. This was the first time we've gone back and done it again. We're grateful for it because it's provided some important information for us to more accurately target our approach to financial aid, but some really troubling results. 
And this goes across segments and across the state of California when you look geographically. A third of our respondents to this survey, students who are currently enrolled, are housing insecure. More than that, 35% met the US Department of Agriculture's criteria for being either low or very low uh, food security. And I think even more concerningly, if this weren't enough, uh, these are even greater challenges for our black and Latinx students. More than half of black students face low or very low food security, and that's more than four out of 10 Latinx students. So this is also a, a racial equity imperative for us to, to respond to. So some solutions that the campaign's looking at, as well as our partners across the state, is of course expanding and consolidating the financial aid programs, ensuring that at each step of that process, our most vulnerable students and their needs are prioritized first. Um, we're at what is likely the tail end of the longest period of economic growth in California's history. Governor Brown, uh, through um, some difficult work and some uh, robust conversation with partners throughout the state, built up a surplus for us in Sacramento. Um, this is the window of our opportunity. The window of opportunity is now. The time to act and invest is now. We may not have these conditions for years again. Um, we need to connect financial aid to the total cost of attendance and not just tuition. That is so clear, and I think the Sears results that were just issued last week really speak to that. Uh, Jesse and, and the assembly member both spoke to some of these proposals that um, are really important. We welcome conversations around how costs can be more predictable for all students, but it is necessary and not sufficient to really responding to the affordability challenges that our low-income students and students of color are facing. So we need to ask ourselves, what problems are we trying to solve when we invest in aid and inform each decision in that way? And, and finally, we need to remove these eligibility barriers. I mentioned the time out of high school barrier for students to get an entitlement award. There's an age limit on students who transfer from a community college and go to a university and how they can access state financial aid. We need to think about that. And we need to consider how can we guarantee that our most vulnerable student populations also can benefit from state aid and investment. So with that, um, um, we're going to pivot to a group discussion. Thank you, Jane. Mm -hmm. so, so I hope that you were as troubled, and I think probably the line of the day is that it's easier to get into Cal than it is to get a Cal grant, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I do want to just point out, you know, due to the advocacy of incredible partners like the Institute for College Access and Success and Debbie Cochran, who has long led the way more than a decade in California on these issues, we are finally at a place where we have seen the largest number of competitive Cal Grant awards at 41,000. But when fewer than one of eight eligible students is still receiving those competitive Cal Grant awards, I would argue we have a crisis that needs to be addressed. And if it cannot be addressed, during the longest economic boom in California history, then when will we have the courage to finally tackle this? Um, I would like to open up the conversation by actually asking Debbie if she would share a few words in reaction to this data, um, given the climate that we have and the opportunity before us. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Say something profound. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Assembly Member, I will start by saying um, James Qual invited and asked me okay. to make sure I said hello. So, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think you know all the all of your comments. I think just really hit the nail on the head of exactly why we why we need to do that, that why we need to reform financial aid, why we need to think bigger. Um, I think we you know we have routinely looked at these affordability challenges over time and see, consistently seen that community college students are struggling. We've been talking up and down the state about, um, about food and housing insecurity and how that needs to be addressed. Not only food and housing insecurity, but also how those things play into completion rates. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. students who have to choose between you know, whether to buy their meals for a week or a textbook are probably going to choose their meals and that's what they should do, mm -hmm. right? Um, we need to make it possible for them to not make the choice. Um, and I would also just connect this to the student debt crisis. Um, you know, California um, policymakers often 
feel pretty good about student debt because you know as a as a as compared to other states, mm -hmm. students who are graduating from colleges tend to leave school with less debt than in other states. But when we dig deeper, you see that that debt is very disproportionately held. Mm -hmm. Right, six in I think about two thirds of all students who are graduating from the CSU system who have student loan debt have family incomes under twenty seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Um, you know, students who are leaving school with debt are much more likely to be students of color, low-income students across the board. So all of these issues are connected to economic mobility, mm -hmm. the role that student debt plays in, in um, holding students back once they do earn their degrees. And I think I agree completely, the time is now. Um, you know, earlier we went around and we all said our, what our word was in terms of that, what, what do we think about? And my word was bravery because I think it does take an act of bravery to really try to tackle these. And I think it's from, from two vantage points. One, um, it's bravery to fight for the resources that are needed. And you know, it's always, it's always a um, bit of a food fight when it comes to the state budget process and figuring out who gets resources. Um, and the reality is for financial aid, it's the students who are benefiting a lot more than the schools. And the students are just not as organized and vocal in the state policy conversations as the institutions with their um, very well-funded um, advocacy teams. So that's one piece. And then also, there's a lot of hard choices I think mm -hmm. in um, Jake's discussions around how do we think about barriers? Who gets prioritized? The students that we might say on paper look like they're the neediest are not necessarily the most vocal either. Mm -hmm. And so we need to have the bravery to make those choices that are hard, but we know are right for the state. Wonderful to be absolutely true. I would love to hear from some of our incredible student leaders who are here today. What are your reactions? Yeah, uh, I myself today am presenting as the delegate from the. I'll just move your yeah, tags so yeah. yeah. I myself uh, today am representing as a student, uh, as a delegate from the student senate of the community college. Um, yeah, the word that I used to describe our financial aid system is imperfect. Because, you know, the system is great, but there are still rooms for improvement. So, uh, in order to solve the problem, we wholeheartedly support the Senate Bill 291, which is all CC students should get financial aid regardless of their status. And as an international student myself, I just feel like um, on our campus, or maybe all CC students, it's better for us to have more scholarship opportunities, and um, including and for all the undocumented student students here, because of their status, they might be having a hard time to find uh, scholarship opportunities for themselves. Therefore, I suggest that um, the the Senate or the California State should open more scholarship opportunities for the uh, international students and for the undocumented students. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciated what Assemblymember Wick said about inequity and and the fact that if you were black and Latinx, you know these troubling trends with student debt um, and struggles to access financial aid have even graver implications. And I think for undocumented students as well, this is a reality that we should be talking about. <laughs> Alexis and then Alex. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, for me, I just say all this data, I mean, we're always talking about it, but it's not even that it hits close to home, it's that it is home. Mm -hmm. you know, like it is exactly what, not even just like who we're dealing with, but I mean, like things that I've dealt with, mm -hmm. right? You know, coming from community um, college. And I always tell people, well, you know, when you transfer, they're gonna actually give you money. So you will be able to, you know, do everything that you need to. And of course, coming to Berkeley and how you take up private loans because all these loans are not enough, even, you know, mm -hmm. just even after financial, even after tuition paid for, even after I get student loans, right? Um, and so really just that it really is disproportionately affecting students in different populations. And you know, just going through community college and into UC or CSU, you know, it's just you you see that along racial lines. You see that mm -hmm. along, you know, students who are in poverty. And 
it's just it's so difficult already as it is to be one of those students and going to college and making that decision and mm -hmm. you know times going against what your family wants for you and, you know just you're already you already have to be so brave in that act mm -hmm. and then when you're hit with all this financial instability in a place where you're supposed to already meet these different you know you're supposed to be changing those personal words that you can suddenly go to college and you're in these classrooms with other people and you have these professors that are you know you're already dealing with an entire different environment. And then outside of that, you know, you watch other students walk by and they don't have to have a job. Mm -hmm. They don't have to have two jobs like you do, right? And so just having that there, it affects us so much, not only you know, financially, but just academically and you know, mental health, just all those different things, they all come together. And so, I mean, I know it's something that you work for, of course, you know, so and it's really just you know, trying to finally be able to make that big stride in the Tiny one, for example, is for. Mm -hmm. So I mean just having that narrative of how it affects students in all these different ways is mm -hmm. you know it's it's real. Mm -hmm. And all of us I'm sure have, have faced it. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Um I think when it comes to financial aid, one of the biggest problems especially with community colleges is people don't c consider that community college communities are a lot different mm -hmm. than what you find in the CSUs and the UCs. So for example, if you go up to more rural Northern California, you have College of the Siskiyous, College of the Redwoods, a lot of times public transportation isn't as accessible as you would out here. And then even, so for example, I started out my college journey at Diablo Valley College before going to CCC. So I used to take the bus home. You jump through two different systems. You have County Connection, Central County, and then you have uh, West Cat over my neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, I don't think policymakers realize that students are in the same situation with like UC Davis, where you can just bike to the opposite side of campus or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Now considering that somewhere that should take 30 minutes to travel to travel to may take two hours just because that's the only back road. Yeah. And then sometimes two things is a disconnect um, when it comes to people realizing that a lot of UCs, a lot of CSUs, and even private colleges like St. Mary's don't offer online programs. Mm -hmm. So your only option is to go in person. Mm -hmm. And this takes out a good chunk of your day. And a lot of times, especially at St. Mary's, your financial aid is dependent on your status. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be going in as a full-time student or a part-time student, that financial aid is gonna be very, very different. So I think that's some of the I drove an hour each way to go to community college. So you know, right? it was, it was, that was the only, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think if I could just jump in, um, my name's Valerie. I'm a student at UC Berkeley, but I'm a recent transfer student. Um, so I went to school at Crafton Hills College, which is in the San Bernardino Community College District. Um, this is my first semester on Berkeley campus, and I'm still really getting used to navigating the bureaucracy that's associated with my financial aid. Um, I never even applied to any university, such as the SAT, after or during high school, because I was I knew that I did not have the capacity to pay for a four-year university. Mm -hmm. And my family, as much as they wanted to support me in my educational journey, don't, first of all, have much college experience. And mm -hmm. then, second of all, I would not feel comfortable asking my family to pay for college because they struggle to pay for everything else already. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's something that a lot of students um, experience. Mm -hmm. um, they give me the support that that like I need as far as like, they're there for me. They're always, you know, like willing to like call me or like check in on me, and I love that, and I'm so grateful for them. But they don't have the financial capacity to support me in a way like that. Mm -hmm. So I went to community college, and I was able to receive a waiver that waived my tuition because of my low income status. But I still had to work. I worked three different jobs in community college. And that was just so I could save, so that I could come to a university. Mm -hmm. And then when I got here. It's just so much more expensive than I could even could have even imagined, and navigating the bureaucracy associated with financial aid, like mm -hmm. my Cal grants were held up because I didn't fill out one form that stated that I was switching schools, mm -hmm. and so my whole financial aid mm -hmm. was like almost about to be lost, and I was like, am I going to have to go back home? And so I I was able to get Cal grants because I went to community college right out of high school, but. I know so many students who are older students or student parents or student veterans mm -hmm. who didn't do that right out of high school. They were living their adult lives and that's totally okay, but what makes them you know, less eligible for financial aid than I am? Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit about like, the transfer bureaucracy mm -hmm. around financial aid and, and sort of navigating that system and I'm still learning to navigate it, um, but it's, it's definitely an extremely important system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, to go off what Valerie was saying, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily the financial aid options that are the biggest issue. 
but maybe finding those options. Um, for me personally, it was difficult to find um, certain resources available to me, like Phi Theta Kappa, or um, even resources uh, to the financial aid office here at BCC. I, I would say that the bureaucratic, nav the bureaucratic navigation is super difficult. Um, we did a survey here at ASBCC, and 21% of our students uh, said that the biggest obstacle at BCC was the finances or um, textbook prices. And I think that if we could increase the amount of staff training or staff that can support them, that would be beneficial. Um, I know that at Laney College, or at Merritt College, they don't even have a financial aid supervisor. Um, and so the president of their college has to basically deal with all of that. And I don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. and just to comment on some of this, you know, I think part of it too, and like I just use my experience, my family wasn't, like some families are like the kids are going to college and that's part of growing up and it's infused every single day in their life and they're on the track and they're in the honors classes and they're in all these things right where it's like constantly part of the family experience but for long for some long families that's not the case right and so the parents don't know how to navigate this stuff or aren't pushing every single day on this stuff and so the kids then don't know how to navigate this stuff and so it's hard it's like where do we go then when we need that kind of help we're looking for those resources at the school. So your point is like is very right on. I too didn't feel comfortable. Like my parents were, and again, my mom had gone through this prior to me going through it, so she was more aware. But my dad didn't get a college degree. You know, my mom was the first, and so it wasn't like they didn't push me in the same way that I I know mm -hmm. some of my counterparts. Like when I worked at the White House and all these kids mm -hmm. that went to like private schools and like you know <laughs> like I, it's just like a very different cultural thing too. That, that I think is very present. Yeah, and then if I, I, if I could add too, I think I had a similar upbringing because my parents were coming from an immigrant family, immigrating to the United States. My parents were both working all the time and then as the eldest child, I felt like I had to do the navigation for myself mm -hmm. and also for my siblings. So I don't even remember a time when my parents were even working on financial aid applications mm -hmm. with me. Um, when I was um, going um, to school, I didn't have any loans. I worked when I went to community college first, but then when I transferred to UC, I was working the entire time, mm -hmm. and I could not afford to live at the UCI campus, and so I commuted four days a week to go to my classes. And um, similarly, even when you're done with your bachelor's degree, taking out the loans too for graduate work, and it takes a while to you know get a job after you complete your degrees, and then years to pay off. Mm -hmm. So I think that the conversation that we're having now, we're always talking about research, all of the reports that have come out, the TICUS report and others, we have all of the data that we need you know, so that we can really convince, you know, members of our community statewide that we need to make these changes. I, I appreciate you surfacing that, um, your experience, because I think it's an important piece of the conversation um, that we talk about increasing the number of folks who are actually filling out their financial aid applications, yeah. right? I mean, I grew up in a working class Chinese immigrant family where my mom, a single parent, uh, waited tables to make ends meet, and uh, even then her English proficiency was limited, and when it came time to actually fill out my FAFSA, all she could do to help was cobble together, you know, a couple dozen pay stubs to show proof of income. And I still remember being at a Kinko's, flattening out crumpled receipts, and copying and printing them so I could send off my financial aid applications. I'm glad I had the wherewithal to mm -hmm. fill out my financial aid application. But I know in California, mm -hmm. there are too many seniors, um, many of them students of color, who don't. And, you know, I think in California, we rank 30th in the nation in terms of FAFSA completion. 54% uh, of students filled out a FAFSA application in 2018. And that's not nearly good enough. Mm -hmm. We need to do better. 
And so, um, I work at an education trust class. Um, and we are championing legislation that would ensure that all students, all young people, complete a financial aid application before they graduate from high school. So as a fellow organizer, my heart asks to you, Bobby. Wait, wait, Andy used to work for me. <laughs> Consider um, exploring the legislation that we're pushing for. It's AB 1617. It's currently sponsored by uh, Assemblywoman Reyes. We would love more co sponsors. Mm -hmm. It's a really critical uh, piece of legislation. We know that completing financial aid application is crucial to post secondary access. And so the bill basically is focused on how we get more fast enough completion. That's exactly right. Yeah, it mm -hmm. would actually require that all students, all high school students, complete a fast application before they graduate. And we know, you know, in states like Louisiana that have actually implemented this, yeah. their FAFSA completion rate increased by 30%. And we actually have local school districts in California that have implemented the same policy, like Alberta District down south, and their FAFSA completion uh, rate skyrocketed. And, and Eloise Reyes is doing it? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Sign me up. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> you could have texted, but it's fine. <laughs> this is how business gets done. I would love to hear from our business partners at the East Bay Leadership Council, because I think that there are real workforce implications mm -hmm. to not having students access financial aid. Absolutely, yeah. I think this is a very important issue for us, for our members, um, certainly for the business community as a whole, even those that aren't necessarily a part of East Bay Leadership Council. Um, I think the first thing I'd want to hit on is to definitely talk about food insecurity. It's a huge issue for us. It's something we feel really passionately about. Um, I was a Cal Grant B recipient. I wouldn't have been able to go to college, first generation college student, if someone didn't really walk me through what the FAFSA was and how it worked. I was very fortunate that I went to a high school where there was someone there to help me do that. But once I got to college, I didn't always have money for food. And yeah. food was often the thing that took you know, a back seat to me being able to pay my rent. And it's wonderful that we do have financial aid. I'm very grateful that we do, but it certainly doesn't cover the full cost. I was at UC and at a community college, and in neither of those situations yeah. did food insecurity not impact my life. And so I know the Contra Costa Community College District is currently reporting about a 54% student rate of food insecurity right now. That's really high. I mean, mm -hmm. the majority of your students are experiencing food insecurity. Mm -hmm. And I think things like food pantries and increased funding in those ways are really wonderful. But when you look at the Cal um, fresh rates, especially in Contra Costa County, they're alarming and yeah. very concerning. And while I definitely think financial aid and taking in the whole week is really important, I'd love to also see more ways for students to access Cal Fresh mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I did three CalFresh bills this year. I know, thank um, you so much. Yeah, no, and, and one of one got signed into law, and that's that's more helping um, younger kids who are on a free and reduced lunch just be signed up automatically for CalFresh. Mm -hmm. We leave $1.9 billion on the table in California mm -hmm. that we don't pull down in federal funding on this issue. But the other one was the foster care kids and f figuring out when they go to college how they can just keep it. Yes, exactly. Which would be wonderful. I mean, so, yeah, I'm with you on all of this. Yes. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. even my sister is currently trying to enroll in CalFresh as a college student, and her issue is she can't get on the phone for her interview because yeah. she has classes every day from eight to five. Yeah. I mean, it's a very basic issue, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. yet, it's, we're hearing it constantly in Contra Costa County. People are like, but I'm working. Yeah. How do I get that interview? And if they call twice and it's a restricted number, that's it. You're out of the system. Try again. Mm -hmm. And I just say that to say, when we're talking about bureaucracy, I don't think that's an issue for students just with the FAFSA system. I think it's in our other systems as well. Um, now that said, workforce <laughs> is also a huge component of the work that we're trying to do this year. We really hope in 2020 to push forward more and more of the conversations about how we provide more opportunities, especially in our communities, in which we're lacking diversity in our workforce. We have it in our community, and yet we're not able to make that connection. And I think that this plays a really huge role. If some of our students in Richmond and Antioch and Brentwood were able to see themselves in, for example, health careers, and knew that they had the assistance to help them make that possible, we wouldn't have such a deficit that we currently have. Mm -hmm. For some of our highest paying, most skilled work and availability. Um, and I know that's something that a lot of our hospitals are invested in, and a lot of our nonprofits are invested in, but I think we need to make it feel accessible to our students. Mm -hmm. We need them to see themselves. And when they walk into a hospital and they don't see anyone who looks like them, or they walk into, 
you know, any kind of health-based situation, or they walk into their counseling center at their school, mm -hmm. and not one of their counselors looks like that, or not one of their counselors has had an experience like theirs. I mean, mental health is a whole other thing I'd love to talk about that when it comes to our low-income students, but I just need to say this to say, anything I think we can do to help make this feel like something that's accessible so that our workforce sees themselves, mm -hmm. we want to be supportive of. Assembly Member Wicks, I know that you have to leave at 12.30, so I would like to have you, um, as, as we close up this conversation before you leave, really you know, hear from you about how this group of incredible individuals who are advocates yep. from education to students to yep. business, how can they lift up their voices and be effective in furthering this affordability conversation and supporting you yeah. as you're trying to do this work in the legislature? Sure, thank you. Um, and thank you all for the um, insight. It's, it's very helpful um, and underscores, I think, a lot of what many of us sort of see and feel and breathe every single day when you guys all do this work. Um, I think the biggest thing, you know, I'm, I'm one year in, uh, and so I'm still learning a lot, but what I, some of the things I, I learned uh, in this past year and I did get eight bills signed by the governor, so I was eight bills. my CalFresh bills. But, you know, when you're bringing together disparate, different voices on an issue, right? If you're bringing together educators and the business community and labor and different types of folks together on a bill, that's where I think you have more momentum in Sacramento. Um, and when you also align on a couple key priorities as opposed to everyone having mm -hmm. 50 different priorities. And so I think that's some of the homework I would, I would ask of you all is thinking through what are the key issues that you feel how we can address some of these challenges yeah. from a legislative point of view. What are those the handful of two or three things as a group that you all think are the most important things? And then how do we get unlikely suspects, unlikely allies who maybe don't always agree on everything to come together and to push for this in Sacramento. Um, those are the, the ways that I think um, coalitions can be most successful in Sacramento. So I, I leave that all with you to think about what those things are. I mean, I know there's there's 291. Annie just pitched me another bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's those are the things that I think are, are most are most helpful. And you know, and the other challenge we have is you know a lot of what we're talking about here cost money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and the governor really ultimately is making these decisions where it's like, okay, more money for higher ed, does that mean less money for early childhood? Does yeah. that mean, you know, like there's all these sort of constant trade-offs. Mm -hmm. um, and he's hearing from a lot of people, as are legislators hearing from a lot of people on, and all people that, I mean, I agree with all these issues, right? Like I think we need this sort of holistic approach. But I also think we need to figure out our revenue stream issues, yes. yeah. you know, so that we can fund more things so that early childhood doesn't have to compete against K through 12 or higher ed. Let's fund all of those things, mm -hmm. you know? And there are a lot of different conversations on the revenue stream going on in Sacramento right now, which include Prop 13 reform, which I am a big supporter of. But frankly, that's the tip of the iceberg in my opinion. You know, we have to figure out other ways to, to raise new revenue. We have the, one of the wealthiest, fifth largest economy in the world, highest concentration of millionaires and billionaires. You guys know the stats, and yeah, we're not funding the things that we need to fund, and so what are the other ways we can think about the funding stream? Mm -hmm. So if you have creative ideas on that, um, that's also where I think there needs to be kind of smart people thinking about how we actually raise more resources to fund all of these things. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I just ask yeah. you a follow-up on that? Because I think one of the biggest challenges in Sacramento, and I've certainly seen this since I've been doing the work, is that because of the finite funding, um, there are a lot of workarounds versus addressing comprehensive the financial, financial issues. Yeah. yeah. And so, so we figure out a way to provide some additional funding around food insecurity. Right. We, we figure out a way to provide a second mm -hmm. year of free community college. Right. Then we don't do the hairy, audacious work yeah. of really tackling comprehensive financial aid reform. Mm -hmm. So on that note yeah. of thinking about revenue streams differently mm -hmm. and, and harnessing the collective power of the coalition to mm -hmm. come together, mm -hmm. how do we get people to come together and have that long-term, long-range vision? Well, you know, I think a white paper laying out the vision as a starting point for policymakers, and maybe that already exists. Mm -hmm. Does that exist? Yeah, no, it doesn't actually. Around so, this like a white paper on that of like what is a comprehensive vision mm -hmm. of what a good financial uh, financial aid system can look like. Something to because here's the reality. Yeah. You know, I voted on thousands of bills this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I co-authored a bunch of them. I ran my own legislative package. 
we're doing so much stuff. The, the legislators are doing, it's like, it's a little bit like, it's just a constant like whack-a-mole in a way. And so it's hard to get legislators to really focus on, you know, what are the things that, and, and so that that focus, what helps is, here's the vision, mm -hmm. you know? And so what is that vision of what a real system that benefits all, that takes into effect the equity issues, the challenges mm -hmm. that we discussed here, how do we really address that and what does that look like? Mm -hmm. We'll help policymakers then say, okay, Okay, I like this, I like this. I don't know if we can do this this year. Maybe that's next year, whatever, mm -hmm. right? We can then react to it. And then finding like champions to work on it, right? In, in the legislature, in the governor's office, um, et cetera. But that would be my recommendation is a white paper that lays out that vision. That's great advice. Mm -hmm. So, Well, please join me in giving us Thank you guys. And all these like surprise friends around the table. You know what, by the way, this was my moment of the year for AD 15 this year.